This week, we welcome Chuck Gardner, Senior Director of Government and Nonprofit Engagement for Cyber.org, to discuss Project Access, training a diverse future workforce. In the Leadership and Communications section, fake CISO profiles on LinkedIn target Fortune 500s. Cybersecurity Executive Communication and Importance of Metrics, Tips for Developing Cybersecurity Leadership Talent, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. It's time to rethink how we approach cybersecurity because the reality is modern cyber attackers are already past your initial defenses. ExtraHop helps your security team find and eradicate advanced threats before real damage is done. Protect your enterprise and customers with better defense. Learn more about how ExtraHop stops advanced threats at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. That's extra H-O-P. Cloud security compliance doesn't have to be complicated. Whether your business is migrating to the cloud or a seasoned cloud service provider, Bar Advisory can help you simplify security and compliance frameworks, including SOC, ISO, and HITRUST. As an extension of your team, Bar Specialists will put your people first and empower them with the knowledge and tools needed to stay secure and compliant at every stage of your business growth. Learn how Bar can help your company build trust with consumers and become cyber resilient at securityweekly.com forward slash Bar Advisory. That's B-A-R-R Advisory. Managing and protecting the world's grueling number of endpoints, enabling Tanium's customers to see, control, and protect every endpoint everywhere. Tanium's mission is to provide certainty in uncertain times with the industry's only converged endpoint management. Trusted by the U.S. military and the majority of the Fortune 100, today, Tanium helps manage and protect nearly 30 million endpoints. Tanium, the power of certainty. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Tanium to learn more. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 279, recorded October 3rd, 2022. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me today are a a, a plethora of co-hosts, all remotely. First, we're going to start with Josh Marpet. Josh, welcome back. It's been a while. Pleasure. Always a pleasure to be here on your show, Matt. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Also joining who I have not seen in a very long time, good friend of mine, Mr. John Kinsella. Hey, M- hey, ASW host. How you doing? I missed you. I, and also it's October and I, I, I just had to come and see you while I'm here on the show. Good to be here. Yeah, yes, thank you. And also joining us again this week is Mr. Tyler Robinson. Tyler, always a pleasure. Thanks, Matt. You got all the co-hosts this week. We had to get our mat time in somehow, you know. I guess. Uh, I guess that's what happens when you change jobs. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. We review those suggestions often and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Chuck Gardner serves as the Senior Director of Government and Nonprofit Engagement for Cyber.org, the academic initiative of the Cyber Innovation Center. He has more than 10 years of classroom experience and holds an EDD, EDD, and an MBA from the University of Phoenix and a bachelor's from the United States Merchant Marine Academy. After leaving the maritime industry in 2006, he became a career-changing educator, first teaching algebra and geometry in middle school, then moving to a high school robotics and cyber classroom, where he first encountered cyber.org and wrote content for them. As a senior director, he now oversees much of the federal and state-based outreach and national support for standards adoption, pathway development, and education workforce development initiatives. Chuck. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate you having me. Joshua, John, Tyler, it's good to see everybody, and uh, I look forward to having a conversation. It's Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It started on Saturday officially. We're the third third day into to Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Kevin Knowlton came on uh, September of last year. I looked it up to yeah. talk about uh, Cyber.org and some of the initiatives that were going on at the time. Uh, so it's a great time. 
to be, you know, talking about cybersecurity and education and and all the work that that cyber.org does. Um, so let's start. Where's Kevin? And how did you end up in the chair? I guess is the first question. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so uh, thanks again. Kevin Knowlton uh, is now the vice president for the Cyber Innovation Center. As you mentioned, cyber.org is the academic initiative of the Cyber Innovation Center. Cyber Innovation Center is the anchor tenant of this 3,000 acre National Cyber Research Park we have out here in Bossier City, Louisiana. Right outside my window uh, is it's much of that land and includes uh, a, a building occupied by General Dynamics. We've got uh, a joint space uh, opportunity for Louisiana Tech University and Bossier Parish Community College and just finished coming out of the ground uh, is a new, I don't know, 20,000 square foot research facility for uh, called Louisiana Tech Research Institute. So um, uh, Kevin's now um, kind of overseeing all of that uh, and left us minions down here in a third floor to run cyber.org, uh, where we operate under the grant from uh, CISA. Uh, to bring quality instructional materials to teachers across the country in K-12 at no cost. That's great. I, I love the program. We're going to talk about Project Access, which is a very, it's one of the outreach programs, right? And this one's kind of near and dear to my heart, having an autistic son. This one is actually, you know, really to bring in other diverse talent, including special needs students as well. So give us a little background on Project Access. Sure. Uh, and uh, real quick, uh, if, if there's a, a aircraft flyover, it's two o'clock and the first B-52 from Barksdale Air Force Base, which is just on the other side of the building, just had its first flyby. So about every three or four minutes that may be happening. So uh -huh. uh, we can keep time pretty much for the rest of the afternoon that way. But um, Project Access actually stemmed um, initially from a, a, a grant that we had won uh, back in 2016 from NSF uh, to study some of this work. So um, we had a national National Science Foundation grant uh, after we had done uh, some work with students with disabilities. Uh, the name Project Access was identified for that grant, and then it became uh, the larger cyber.org initiative of Project Access. But uh, it has uh, an initial, uh, an interesting history, right, that goes, that has ties to NSF, but also uh, to our very good friends uh, in the state of Virginia and their state agency called the Virginia Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired. Um, so this actually goes back one more year, 2015, we we were approached by the State Department of Education in Virginia uh, to follow up on an initiative from then Governor McAuliffe to bring uh, a cyber summer camp to students from across the state. Uh, they wanted uh, some opportunity for all of the, um, the high schools who had interest uh, in all eight of the superintendent's regions uh, and, and the Department of Ed, right, with this mantra to bring cybersecurity education to those students needed someone to provide that content. Uh, and they approached us and uh, we brought training to over 250 teachers, high school teachers from across the state. They impacted over 700 students. And the first three week cyber summer camp um, event happened the summer of 2016. Uh, that fall, um, we got a call from Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired out of Richmond, uh, essentially saying, right, it was great what you did for all of those students, but we have a population who can benefit from this content as well. Uh, and we'd like to put our heads together and, and kind of discuss the art of the possible to bring that cyber instruction uh, to our students. So we we met, we brought, uh, this, as the story goes, everything, including the kitchen sink, to a meeting in Richmond. Richmond. We had brought Raspberry Pis. We brought Arduinos. Um, last ditch effort, I brought a Bobot um, because it had been what we were using. And I'll explain those platforms uh, in just a second. But um, we were all hyped on, on these some of these really great um, ubiquitous platforms. I mean, everybody's using Raspberry Pi. The entire maker community has Raspberry Pi at some point doing something for them, monitoring you know soil moisture or hosting websites. Uh, it's a really great, powerful platform that is gaining some significant adoption uh, in K-12. Uh, the problem was the programming environment wasn't accessible. So it all comes down to accessible curriculum and being able to, I'm gonna use air quotes, right, to, to see the content through uh, accessible technology like a screen reader or magnifiers. And a lot of these uh, editors present text as images rather than as readable text. So the editor for the Arduino is not legible by a screen reader. The editor for a um, 
uh, Raspberry Pi isn't isn't editable uh, legible by a screen reader. Uh, so last ditch effort, we dusted off that Bobot. The Bobot is uh, an old technology from Parallax Robotics out in Rockland, California. That's programmed in BASIC, and the editor presents beautifully legible text uh, that works swimmingly with screen readers. Uh, so this first iteration of Project Access used a basic powered robot where the students built their own bots, they assembled their own circuits, they programmed their own code, and it's th it was this week-long um, residential interactive opportunity. And we brought students with all sorts of uh, uh, opportunities you know, for, for learning here. We had blind students, we had students with hearing disabilities, we had students on the spectrum, and everyone succeeded. And it changed lives. That first camp we hosted in 2017 changed lives. Um, I'm still in communication with a couple of those uh, those students and the organizer, uh, Tish Harris. Uh, she and I, we, we speak at least weekly, uh, if not monthly, on this topic and what we're going to do next year. Um, but there are students from that year one who have come back and contributed every year since then, who have gone on to study um, cybersecurity. There was one student, his his goal was to be a wrestling coach. He's now passed Security Plus. He's on to other credentials. He's studying at Blue Ridge Community College, doing really wonderful things. We did two, three years of the Bobot camp, and then we altered uh, and, and started studying Linux and cybersecurity and web pages and, and accessible web pages. And these kids built their own web pages in a, in a week-long summer camp. And just fantastic opportunities to bring um, a tr what what would be a traditional classroom instruction on cyber and cybersecurity and conversations on real world applications of these to a population who had never even considered it, uh, much less had the opportunity to study it in their classroom. Uh, and that's what Project Access is. We're now taking it to uh, states across the country. This past summer, we hosted events uh, in Ver Vermont and in Michigan with Nebraska and uh, Arkansas and again, Virginia, but we're also bringing it next year to Colorado and New Jersey, um, where there are state agencies for students with disabilities, we want to make sure they have access to this curriculum. So Project Access in a nutshell, in a very big nutshell. A very big nutshell. Uh, basic, my first programming language. So I, I got to go check out the Bobot because I probably still remember how to program in basic. Uh, most of my other programming skills have gone straight downhill, haven't they, Mr. Kinsella? <laughs> Of course not. <laughs> but I think it's great that you've actually moved the program beyond basic yeah. and now in Linux and in other technologies that are actually really relevant to our industry right now. There is a lot of work being done in Linux and, and especially uh, for web page and web page design and, and penetration testing, for example. I think those are great skill sets to have. And, and they are, and, and it, that also comes with its own set of unique challenges. For example, um, our, the curriculum that cyber.org writes through the DHS CISA grant to give away to, to teachers uses um, Kali Linux and, and a lot of the tools that appear in Kali Linux, like Metasploit and um, Social Engineering Toolkit and, and John the Ripper. And there are components of that, and, and you're going to nod your head when you hear this. Right. When you open up Metasploit for the first time, you get that splash screen and it is full of text, like those 1980s pictures we used to make in ASCII, right? Using all of those textual characters. A screen reader wants to read every individual character. And these students will be stuck for an hour waiting for their screen reader to paint that picture uh, that is cute, right? In Metasploit, it's cute in Social Engineering Toolkit, but it, it really puts us a step behind when we're trying to encourage all students uh, to, to test these tools because their screen readers are just going to burp, right? When they see that big splashy image made of ASCII characters. Uh, so we're working with some, some partners now to kind of streamline those, uh, take out some of those splash screens, maybe recreate uh, what a Metasploit framework looks like in a more visual friendly um, atmosphere. So, so Kali didn't come without its own set of challenges either, uh, but it's really been a great tool. Kids are super excited this year to be breaking passwords and to see credential harvesting and key loggers uh, in action. It was it was really it was a wonderful experience. What kind of organizations are trying to partner with or kind of give back to you guys from the community side? Yeah. Like, do you have uh, ways to volunteer? Interesting avenues for other uh, organizations that try and do this, maybe at a smaller scale to contribute? Yeah, uh, great question. So so one of the partners we've had for a number of years now, and I hope I'm not calling anybody out um, or, or calling foul here, but Palo Alto Networks has been working with us um, for 
uh, the, the last couple of years. Um, since we we partnered way back in 2017 with the Girl Scouts to develop cybersecurity badges, um, Palo Alto Networks was a partner of ours. They then helped us with the North Dakota uh, Pre-K 20W initiative, which is bringing cybersecurity awareness to primary, secondary, post-secondary, uh, and graduate studies all the way up to workforce. Uh, and they were, um, they came to visit the camp we had this summer, uh, in Richmond where, where we did the cybersecurity work, uh, and, and saw the struggle with those splash screens and said, let's help make a, make a better functioning, uh, demo for these kids to practice in. Uh, but they're also bringing some technology down to support that as well. Uh, other areas, Tyler, where, where folks can support are, um, you know, we've, we've got workshops that we're hosting all throughout the fall. Um, we started, I think two weeks ago in September and we're going straight through uh, to some some time in December. We've got um, high, our high school technical cybersecurity course. We've got workshops to help teachers become confident in teaching that content in their classroom because not every K-12 teacher knows cybersecurity, much less as a cybersecurity expert. So our job not only is to write curriculum and to give it away, but give confidence to those teachers. So we've got these workshops. And the cool thing about the workshops is they're open to anyone. Uh, if you want to go to cyber.org slash events and, and take a stroll through uh, the workshops that we have scheduled between now and I think December's up there, um, anyone can sit in on those workshops and kind of see what it is that we're bringing to the K-12 population, whether it's our middle school cybersecurity basics, our high school cybersecurity. We want to encourage community members, right, to understand what's happening in the classroom. Um, we want to be as transparent as possible with the content uh, that's being presented to sons and daughters uh, and grandchildren, right, that are in in the classrooms today. So we welcome anyone to come on in and take a look at those sessions. Uh, Matt, we had spoken earlier about CISOs and, and the role that they can play. Uh, if they're interested in learning about the talent that's being developed in high school, come and take a look at the curriculum that we're giving away. We can't give you the curriculum, but you're more than welcome to sit in on these training sessions to see what it's all about. Uh, so Tyler, we're an open book. All of our resources are free to educators and a lot of our content uh, is free to the general public at large too. So one of the, so there's- oh, Go ahead, Josh. No, go ahead, Josh, go ahead. Uh, so I was I was gonna ask, there's, there's a, there's a component in the infosec scene, uh, the hacker scene, et cetera, whatever, that is uh, that does work on accessibility and and uh, I mean I'm thinking of uh, blind as 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 uh, blind hacker, as as one of our our big uh, proponents for that. I don't know if you know him. No. Okay. Uh, his his handle is blind yeah. hacker. Okay, uh, and that's what he is on Twitter, by the way. And I just hit him up on Twitter and said, Hey, is, have you ever heard of this? Yeah. So you, you can expect yeah. some some queries from somebody that is very in the middle of yeah. This. So I think it was these um, conversations that have introduced me to that uh, handle, but uh, I have not had the pleasure uh, just yet. So um, he's I don't want to, awesome. He's yeah. awesome, and I'm I'm really curious to see how the curriculum will change mm -hmm. when you have people that have been living this world for literally decades. Yeah and can give you some feedback on it. Yeah. And I wonder if you've had that from other people. Uh, yeah, so um, it, it just occurred to me where I did hear that name. We were at a, an event in um, Louisville, Kentucky, the, the Hack Red Con, uh, and, and that group, the Red Seer, uh, brought up uh, Blind Hacker's name. And uh, it's just it's just been so recent that I, I haven't had a chance to reach out yet. But um, we, we want uh, input, we want feedback. Um, we've sure. got a Cyber Range product that's getting ready to go live uh, coming up here in, in about two weeks. And that's gonna be a free opportunity for teachers across the country to bring their students into a safe, secure, sandboxed range environment for their K-12 classroom, not have to rely on the IT department to install technology, air gap, and, you know, make sure it's safe for students to practice on here. It's it's all encased in a web browser. Um, and we want feedback on that. It's going to be in pilot for the first couple of weeks. Um, the, the stuff that we're doing with Project Access, um, I, I bring people into these camps so that they can see it and provide feedback and, and again, help us shape this. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did one of the events here in, in Louisiana, and there was a, a blind user over at General Dynamics uh, who came and visited with the students and talked about uh, the impact of you know cybersecurity on his career, uh, and and those are all conversations we would love to be able to highlight and showcase with uh, with our students. We've got some resources online. We've got some career profile cards that are going to give students an idea of what some job roles in cybersecurity look like and, and pay and what kind of prerequisites and degrees or certifications do you need. Um, 
and on some of those, we have video interviews with people actually doing that job. So if we can bring folks in who are going to be able to talk to this population and and all, uh, you know, students, we all have have disabilities of, of one sort or another, right? We want to make sure that they're all aware of capabilities that they can bring uh, to these uh, to these to these jobs. That's wonderful. Thank you. So, Chuck, one of the challenges, um, education K to 12 makes a lot of sense. For a lot of the disability students, having one myself, there's a transition period, typically after they get through what would be classified their senior year. It's called a transition program. In most states, they run until they're about 21. How, how do we tap into those transition students that have already completed high school still in the system up to 21, but even more importantly, how do we tap into them after they leave transitions? Because I just, I know the challenges having just moved from Colorado to Texas, like finding um, students and, and people to meet with my son, it gets harder as they get older. Are there, are there ways to tap into these students even after they leave high school and transition programs to get them the education, to get them into some of these programs? Sure. And yeah, as the uh, government and nonprofit uh, engagement, what I'm doing is working with the states, but also the state agencies for these students and, and learners and workforce um, members with disabilities. Uh, I know Virginia has a, a program that, that we're involved with that goes from, you know, pre-K to roughly 18, 19, 20 years old. But beyond that, there's workforce opportunities to engage with um, and network with um, in, in most states, uh, if not all. So like I mentioned, you know, our partnerships with Virginia and Nebraska and Arkansas and Colorado and New Jersey, um, there are similar Similar relationships in Washington and Oregon and Maine and Massachusetts. Uh, so it's it's the state agencies that are going to be um, my main point of contact. And what my goal is over the next year or so, right, is to make sure that these state agencies are aware of the employers, but also that the employers are aware of the state agencies. And that's one of the things as, as Tish and I, I mentioned Tish Harris from DBVI, is we go out and we, we speak to um, these work groups and, and these, um, you know, round tables is that, you know, you've got uh, this, this talent pool of outside the box thinkers. These, these students are coming up solving problems in ways that a traditional student hasn't even considered. Um, I had a, someone from year two came and interned for me this, this summer. Uh, and the, the, the problem solving set that they brought to some of the issues that we were working, um, my team hadn't even considered, uh, and, and they were really able to solve some, some really high level problems, um, with some simple Linux, um, maybe, you know, HTML and, and languages and solutions that I don't even understand. Um, but, you know, if, if, if CISOs and employers are looking for outside the box thinkers, this is the population that we're preparing, uh, for you, um, Mr. And Mrs. Uh, CISO or, or, um, you know, employer. Yeah, because I think that, you know, we know all the challenges with the workforce. If there mm -hmm. are other skills that you can now bring in, not only to bolster your team, but also create that diverse em 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 employee um, environment, right? We talk about diversity and inclusion. Uh, we've talked about it on the show many times, right? It brings in a whole set of diverse individuals that can also solve problems uh, for the organization. I think it's really important to figure out how do we make these connections, right? So that, that employers know that these people are out there that like the challenges at the state level. I mean, I just trying to navigate Texas, right? I, I can just tell you, yeah. it's not that easy, right? A lot of these kids, once they're out, like they don't, they don't show up on the state education radars anymore. They fall into Medicare waiver programs, right? Like how do you tap into those programs to provide some of these resources for these kids? I think would be a huge benefit, not only to them, but to the entire cybersecurity uh, workforce. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned a, a funny thing. Kevin and I have a phrase. You've seen one state department of education. You've seen one state department of education. There are 49 others and they're all different. Yeah. Uh, similarly with, with state agencies, they all have, um, you know, budgets that come from the state and it's up to them on how they use it. We could try to encourage them, uh, to show a little love to, to workforce development. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a task that, that we, take on cheerfully uh, day after day. But uh, one thing you mentioned is that, you know, the CISOs need to 
know who the state agencies are. We know the state agencies. I need to meet the CISOs. I want to be that one-stop shop. I want to be the the matchmaker, right? That's going to help connect opportunities with um, workforce uh, across the country. Uh, I'm not shared. I'm not uh, scared to share my contact info. I'm hope it's part of the show notes. But um, you know, our our page uh, cyber.org slash initiative slash project hyphen reach um, will also be there. But that's where um, a lot of information about what we're doing with project reach, our current outreach, uh, and then you know we'll sh- slowly update it to show all of our uh, ongoing opportunities. But I want to make sure that employers are aware of the population and, and we've got some really great talent uh, that's that's being developed as a result of, of these opportunities. I want to make sure that that they all know where to find it. So um, please you know help us help us meet these folks who are looking to fill part of the 700,000 jobs across the country. Chuck, it might be interesting to talk a little bit about um, I don't want to say the other side of this, but so you know we're you're you're doing this amazing work that's actually educating a you know a, a part of the the workforce which has been you know, could have had more attention over the years. Um, there's been great people coming out of these programs for, for years. Now we're going to start seeing them with a little more um, both tech as well as security experience. Can you talk to how that's starting to change um, the corporate environment? And yeah. not so much there's a different person in, in sitting in a cube, but like are these, I'm guessing that not everyone is going into purely tech environments or going into different environments. So how are you seeing a change from that? Is that does that question make sense or it it does? So let me just preface by saying we have to understand this as a long game, right? We're yeah. talking about high school kids that we're impacting, middle mm-hmm. school and even back into elementary. We've got mm-hmm. cybersecurity curriculum that's reaching, reaching back into the elementary space. Um, the the environment that we have here up in Bozier was was developed as a result of this work starting back in two thousand eight, uh, and we still have got you know new opportunities coming out of the ground. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Anyone who's looking for a quick fix to their, you know, 20, 30,000 person shortfall, um, this isn't it. Uh, but we're, we're definitely. We're security. We're all about the quick fix. Come on. You're all about the quick fix, right? <laughs> um, but um, there was a, a point I was going to bring up. Um, Sorry. It, oh, um, the, 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 long, the long fix. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> so you, you, I get it. You, you're, it's not like all these people you've been teaching them for the last 20, 30 years, and they're all everywhere in corporate yeah. environment, right? It's, it's a fairly new program. But are you starting yeah, to see any sign out of that? Or? Uh, so, so I think we are. It's, yeah. it's the conversations that we're having with these students, right? It isn't maybe, you know, a lot of them still don't know if cybersecurity is for them. Mm-hmm. In the Virginia program alone, we've impacted close to 100 students uh, in, in five years. Um, I guess it's over 100 now. And um, not everyone leaves the program wanting to join cybersecurity. So the conversation we have is find your hobby, find something you love, and there's going to be a cybersecurity wrinkle to it. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's working with assistive technology, let's make them more secure, right? You guys know assistive technology. You know JAWS and Orca and all of those screen reader and magnifier technologies. There's a need to make sure that those platforms are secure. Uh, if if uh, uh, um, agriculture is your thing. Uh, there's a lot of agriculture and manufacturing in Virginia. There are cybersecurity implications to those careers too. So take what you've learned here and find the spin that's going to make you do what you want to do, happy doing what you want to do, uh, but also supporting this this need for cybersecurity among all of the workforces, work you know, work areas. So we just want to make sure that that students have awareness that they have a role to fill, uh, and it's it's not always going to be frontline cybersecurity. Um, but the, for the ones who are interested in, yes, like I said, that first year student is uh, he's got two credentials now, wrapping up an associate's degree, um, ready to join that workforce and, and make an impact. So uh, I've got another one who's in a four year program studying math and cybersecurity. He was the one who interned for me this summer. Uh, there is no doubt uh, some uh, high level cybersecure firm is going to gobble him up as soon as he's done um, at Lipscomb University. He's got some really great future ahead of him. Uh, so we're making an impact. Um, John, I just don't know that it's going to solve workforce problems tomorrow, but it's certainly going to mm-hmm. play a role in the future. But that's still totally fine. It's, um, yep. you know, uh, uh, Tyler was on the show with us last week on Application Security Weekly. We were talking to Janet Worthington from Forrester. And they did this, I don't know if you've seen this, Matt, they did this really interesting study. Uh, they looked at the top 50 CS programs at the mm-hmm. at the bachelor level in the U.S. And then they looked at what requirements, graduation requirements on those programs. And none of the top 50 had a requirement that um, the CS kids would have a 
some sort of an application security or some sort of security course. Mm. So it, it, I think this is sort of partially feeding into that, right? If, if someone starts off in a program like this and they go to a two-year program or four-year program, they're already thinking about that, which I think seems to be um, way further along than, than some of some of the folks over the last few years. And nothing bad about it, right? But like we, yeah. we talk about as an industry, we don't have that quick fix. We want to, um, you know, we want to start having people thinking about security a little bit earlier. But mm -hmm. if we're not seeing it in some of the schools or if it's not a requirement in some of the schools, we're, we're not not on the right foot yet, I don't think there. So this is good to see. Yeah. No, you're right. When I was in the classroom, we said, you know, it's too late if you're making your decision in high school, you got to be middle mm -hmm. school. These days we're saying middle school is too late. You got to be making <laughs> awareness in elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our goal at cyber.org is to graduate high school students with not only an awareness of the careers, but credentials if applicable, uh, but prepared for uh, future study without a doubt. So we want to make sure that students who, who choose college are going to be successful in college. Students who choose workforce are going to have credentials to get them those entry level seats uh, in a GDIT or, uh, you know, another another institution in, in their area uh, that's hiring. So, you know, Security Plus, Net Plus, um, uh, A Plus and uh, IT Fundamentals. We've got curriculum that supports all four of those core CompTIA credentials. And we're working on additional uh, as CompTIA releases the next version, right? Linux is coming out soon and cloud security. Um, we want to make sure that there's a K-12 opportunity to raise a student's awareness, potentially get them credentialed before they leave school so that they can become successful, uh, you know, family providing members of society. Yeah. I mean, even if they don't go into cybersecurity, mm -hmm. that's just one more person that understands the fundamentals of cybersecurity yep. and eliminates one more weak link somewhere in an organization. So it's still going to do some positive, and, I think, and regardless. It's just your family, right? The mom and dad yeah. are going to know more about it because the son, the son or daughter knows more about it. The right. grandparents are going to be more aware because the son or the grandson or granddaughter are going over fixing printers, right? Hey, you really shouldn't be clicking on that link. Um, you know, think before you act next time. <laughs> yes. Chuck, it was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Matt, thanks for having me. Uh, John, Tyler, Josh, it's a pleasure. Uh, and again, share my contact info. I want to make sure uh, that we're, we're teaming folks up so that we can uh, we can start making a dent in the cybersecurity workforce problem. Yes, thanks, if everybody. anybody wants to learn more or learn how to get involved, all the connection links are in the show notes for this episode. Feel free to reach out to Chuck directly, go to cyber.org, lots of resources out there. We're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. 